We look forward to the time when there is no Shalom, and we want to welcome you to this week's Bible study. This week's Bible study is a little similar to another one we did called, uh, it was about Moses uh, being a prophet like Yeshua. This week, however, we're talking about the Hebrew prophet Elisha. So it's like Elisha, like Yeshua. So shalom to you, and thank you for joining us today. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Mehola to succeed you as prophet. This is found in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 and 16. So about 150 years after David was king over Israel, God called the Hebrew prophet Elisha to be Elijah's main disciple and successor. When Elijah had come on the scene, Israel had fallen into a very horrible state of extreme apostasy under the leadership of Queen Jezebel and King Ahab, as well as their forerunners. And um, Elijah, which is Eliahu in Hebrew, means my God is Yah faithfully labored to turn Israel from its sin and back to Adonai. And by the end of his ministry, the winds of change were already blowing. Uh, if you remember, he even told God, God, I'm tired. Please take me, kill me, do whatever you need to do. So he was not having a good time of it. Um, but Elijah's time here on earth also, as I said, come to an end. So God gave to Elijah a successor to continue his ministry. Elisha, which means, in Hebrew, God is salvation. We first hear of Elisha in 1 Kings, when God commands Elijah to anoint him as successor. successor. Upon hearing his com this command, Elijah sent, set out from Mount Horeb in the Sinai Desert <clears throat> toward Damascus, seeking Elisha, the son of the wealthy landowner, Shaphat. He found him plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Elijah immediately threw his mantle or his cloak over Elisha. Now, although Elisha had not sought this position and was conscientiously carrying out his duties, he readily understood it as a call to follow him. Uh, I'm guessing maybe these times, if somebody came and threw their mantle on you or their cloak, maybe it was a meaning they already knew. I'm not sure. Um, but after burning his plow, he shared a farewell meal with his father, mother, and friends. He cooked one of the two uh, or two of the oxen that were hooked up to the same uh, plow. Out of 12 yoke, he, he burnt up one yoke and, and used the two oxen that were hooked up to that yoke. And without hesitation, Elisha, quote, set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. 
This is in 1 Kings chapter 19, 21. For the next seven to eight years, Elisha served Elijah faithfully. Shortly before his departure to heaven, Elijah travels to Bethel, Jericho, and the Jordan River. Before each leg of the journey, Elijah seems to test Elisha by saying, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel, then Jericho, and then Jordan. <clears throat> Just as Ruth affirmed to Naomi in Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, and as Peter affirmed to Yeshua in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, Elisha also affirmed each time, quote, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. 2 Kings chapter 2. So each time Elijah told Elisha to stay, Elisha said, no, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to stay here. And he was testing him, obviously, to see if he was going to stick with him. Also, before each journey, a company of prophets told Elisha that Yahweh, the Lord, was going to take Elijah that day. In true prophetic fashion, Elisha replied, yes, I know. This is before each of the, uh, the little trips he made. So upon reaching the Jordan, Elijah touched the waters with his rolled up mantle as 50 prophets looked on. And an echo of past miracles, uh, for example, Moses and Joshua, the waters divided, allowing him and Elisha to cross over on dry land. Once on the other side, Elijah asked Elisha what he could do for Elisha before he was taken. Elisha would then respond, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Not just your regular, what, the same amount of, uh, of power that you have. I want a double amount. And this is found in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. Now, since a double portion of, is the right of the eldest son um, found in the uh, Hebraic laws, in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17, we can understand from this that he was asking to be acknowledged as Elijah's firstborn son, at least in a spiritual um, sense. Okay, so Elijah, or Elisha, was not asking for a physical inheritance, but a spiritual one. In this request, he acknowledged his dependence as a prophet upon the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and not his own personal power. So something that's very important, uh, we as believers in Yeshua, Jesus, need to do the same thing. We need to acknowledge our dependence completely on Jesus, completely on the Ruach HaKodesh, and on the Father. <clears throat> Elijah said that this was a difficult request, but it, that if he saw him when he was taken, that he would receive it. So Elisha did see, obviously, Elijah was, that was taken up into heaven on a chariot of fire and was able to repossess Elijah's mantle that fell to the ground as he went up. So Elijah returned with Elijah's, Elisha returned with Elijah's mantle to the banks of the Jordan, and as he struck the water, he cried out for a sign of his anointing. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? The waters parted again. As they did for Elijah, Elisha's miraculous crossing without Elijah prompted the prophets watching him to acknowledge the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. That's a little weird because um, the Bible says very clearly, do not bow before anyone but the Lord. So with the double portion of anointing on him, Elisha not only became a widely recognized prophet in Israel, but also a miracle worker for the Israelites and foreigners alike. Elisha made himself available to other people, educating them about obeying the Torah, living a life of faith. He traveled widely, advised kings, and befriended the common people, both Israelites and the foreign-born. Now, throughout his ministry, from uh, the year 892 to 832 BC, God used Elisha to touch people in the midst of sickness, death, and wanted in and want in order to lead them into God's restorative mercy and grace. So he kind of was a preemptive, um, kind of was already doing what Yeshua would do when he was here on earth. Yeah, so Elisha was a mir the merciful miracle worker. And early in his ministry, Elisha distinguished himself as a compassionate, merciful, miracle working prophet. Some of these miracles reflected the past, and others foreshadowed, as I said those of Yeshua. As Moses healed the waters of Marah, 
if you'll remember in Exodus chapter 15, 25, so that his nation could survive because the waters were bitter and could not be drunk uh, or drank. Elisha's second miracle healed the spring near Jericho in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So the people of that city could have a clean source of water. And in the chapter, in verse 21, it says, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. Incredible. And the water, it was not just bitter. It would bring death and barrenness to people. <clears throat> so he had to heal the water. His compassion and mercy are again evident in the story of the impoverished widow, the creditor of her deceased husband, who Jewish tradition identifies as Obadiah, was threatening to take her two sons as slaves to pay off his debt. In a stunning display of supernatural, uh, supernatural entrepreneurship, Elisha told her to go throughout the whole village, collect empty jars, and fill them, all of them, with her only jar of olive oil. One little jar, and as just as Yeshua kind of multiplied several baskets of loaves and fish from one basket in Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21, she filled several jars with oil from one jar. The prophet then told her how to save her sons from slavery. Go sell the oil and pay off your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. This is 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. So obviously, it was enough oil, not just to pay off her debt but to live off of what was left. That's incredible. So perhaps the most extravagant miracle is that of birth from barrenness and restoration from death. This opportunity confronted Elisha, who had befriended also a Shunammite woman and her husband. He stayed with them so often in his travels that they even provided him with his own room. He had a little bed and maybe a side table set up for him, a little oil lamp. For he, could, for he would stay there on a regular basis. <clears throat> Elisha's servant uh, Gehazi mentioned that the woman was childless and the wife of an old man. Wanting to do something to repay the woman, Elisha told her, at this season next year, you will embrace the son in 2 Kings 4.16. Now this prophecy obviously came to pass, but when the child grew older, he unexpectedly died. It doesn't say what, what he died from, he just died. She laid him on the prophet's bed, on his bed, and went to look for Elisha, finding him on Mount Carmel. Learning of the death of the child, Elisha sent his assistant, Gehazi, with his staff, telling him to lay the staff on the boy's face, but nothing happened. Okay, so when Elisha finally reached the house, the boy was still dead, and he prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched him out, himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 33 through 35. After doing this the second time, the child was restored to life. On another occasion, during the famine in the land, a pot of stew had been prepared for the prophets. It turned out to be poisonous. They, somebody had gotten some, um, some gourds from somewhere. Um, you know, it can be like uh, maybe, a, maybe a zucchini type plant or something that looks something like uh, some type of a squash. Uh, Elisha made the stew safe to eat because uh, these gourds were poisonous and they said, you're going to kill us. You made uh, <clears throat> some poisonous stew and it was deadly. It wasn't just making them sick. It would kill them. So uh, what did he do? He said he took some flour. He took some flour and threw it in the stew and it made it okay. So, again, in an event that foreshadowed Yeshua's multiplication of a meager provision, he, which he multiplied 20 loaves of barley bread to feed 100 with the food remaining. Also, and this is found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. Now, the gifts of miracles and healing are not given to men or women in the Bible merely to make their life easier on earth, but to multiply the faith in the miracle giver. God, the Father, and His Holy Spirit. So, it's to, to when the miracles are given in any time, whether it's now or back then, it was to increase the faith, obviously, in Yeshua, in uh, Adonai. 
And to this end, Elisha's miraculous ministry was not restricted by caste, class, or nationality. So like Yeshua, he did not always need to be present for a miracle to take place either, as we learn from the story of the Syrian a military commander, Naaman, who had leprosy. And we see this in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. When the military leader uh, was immersing himself, I'm sorry, this is actually um, 2 Kings chapter 5, uh, was cured by immersing himself in the Jordan River seven times. He responded by saying, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And the, the link, the likeness of, is when Yeshua, uh, somebody comes to Yeshua in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. Okay. So Naaman realized that it was God who had healed him, who wanted to reward Elisha. However, Elisha would not take compensation from Naaman for the mighty work that God alone had done. The Lord's mercy is not for sale. And we need to remember that. Those of people out there who see these so-called prophets or people who, who um, even evangelists, who are always asking for money on the television, they're not doing it for the right reason, and they are evil, and they are um, doing it for sale. So it's one thing if God provides somebody uh, what they need as they're ministering. For example, a pastor, a, a traveling prophet, even these days, they need provision, obviously. But it's never to be done for money or any kind of compensation. So Yeshua highlighted the story of Naaman and Elisha in the synagogue of Nazareth, telling them that although there were many lepers who could have been healed by Elisha, um, only Naaman the Syrian was healed. Likewise, <clears throat> how many in Yeshua's day might have been healed but were not because of their unbelief? In Luke chapter 4, verse 27, for example. So Elisha also was a military strategist, okay? As a prophet, Elisha was very knowledgeable, privy to supernatural knowledge that gave him an edge in warfare. Elisha continually frustrated the king of Aram in his attempts to fight Israel. Each time he sent an army to the city, to uh, some city, Elisha warned the king of Israel to avoid it. So effective were these warnings that the king of Aram suspected someone in his own court was a spy. Now, the Bible tells us in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 11 through 14, he says, he summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, which one of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king said one of his officers. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dauphin. He would send horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. So even though Elisha was not present, he knew exactly what was going on in the king's, in this king's room when he was speaking to people. And he would tell the king of Israel. When confronted by the attacking army, Elisha's servant was afraid and asked him what should be done. Elisha reassured him that they were in the company of a much greater army, the supernatural one. And this is awesome. And it says, then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Imagine, there was such a huge army of angels around them. He wasn't looking at what was in front of him. He was new who was fighting for him. Elisha prayed to God to blind the enemy troops, and he led them to Samaria. So imagine, the troops were blinded, and he actually led them up to Samaria. Once inside Samaria, they were at the mercy of Elisha, but he did not harm them. Instead, he had a feast set out before the Aramean troops, who then returned to their homes, and the raids on Israel's territory stopped. <laughs> So we at times might also feel under attack and alone. These are the times we need to call out for help and to have our eyes open. And there's only one we can call out to. God has already released his mighty forces to protect us and we can win the battle without a single shot being fired. We have an edge in warfare, just like Elisha does. Get it. So like Elisha, like Yeshua, we, it's just like us. So in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also we, he made the universe. This is found in Hebrews 1, uh, verses 1 through 2. Elisha stands as an example of humility, mercy, and faithfulness. Now, though a wealthy man brought up with privilege, when God called him into the position of prophet, he faithfully served his master until the Lord took him. Just as Elijah assigned Elisha as the new miracle-working prophet of Israel, Yohanan the Immerser, or John the Baptist, came in the spirit of Elijah and publicly declared Yeshua as the miracle-working prophet from Nazareth. So this kind of brings up a, a little point I'd like to make, though. Although a wealthy man who was brought up with privilege, when God called him into the position, he faithfully served his master. This reminds me of somebody who's been very prominent on the internet these days, Kanye West. Everybody's bashing him, saying, oh, let's see his fruits. Oh, he's this, he's that. He's just a little baby. Guess what? All of you were a little baby at one time. Some still are. So those who like to say, let's see his fruits. Oh, what's he going to do? Let's see what comes up. I'd like to say the same thing to those who are saying that. He is a wealthy man, but instead of using his wealth and his fame to gain money, he is using it to do one thing, spread the word of Jesus Christ. He has changed. I've seen the change in his face and the change in his ways. He's not perfect, just like nobody else is, but that is what we would call a wealthy man who is brought up in privilege when God calling him into a position of, of, of preaching or prophet or whatever they're called to, to be faithful. And that's what we all need to be doing. <clears throat> so like Elisha, Yeshua raised the dead, healed the sick, multiplied food, and defied gravity. Elisha made an axe head float. Yeshua walked on water. But there is one act of mercy that only Yeshua as the Messiah could achieve as the Lamb of God. He offered his own sinless body and blood as an atonement for all the sins of the world. Elisha's main purpose was to finish the work of Elijah and help restore Israel during the very dark time back to the God of Israel. Yeshua has finished that work once and for all, reconciling the entire world back to God through his own righteous life. We only need to trust him and accept his offering on our behalf. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14, day after day, Every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and sets up time. He waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he, Yeshua, has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So like Elisha and Yeshua, we have all been called into the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. So to help us in our ministry through Yeshua, we have access to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who has entrusted each of us with at least one spiritual gift. You can see this in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, and um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11, and verse 28. These gifts are to be used mercifully and strategically to reconcile families, friends, co-workers, communities, and foreigners alike to the God of Israel and to each other. So may each of us, like Elisha, recognize that we can only serve God by wholeheartedly depending on his Holy Spirit, and may we walk in the power and anointing that is so rapid, uh, readily available to those who follow Yeshua. So I would like to close by saying thank you. May we all be found doing what God has called us to do faithfully, not looking upon others, what's going on with other people, but looking upon what God has called each and every one of us to do. Some might be called to be prophets, some teachers, some uh, simple workers in order to provide for others. We don't know, but each person in Christ is called to do at least one thing. Let's be found to be doing that one thing while the time is still at hand. So thank you for joining us today and shalom to all of you. Now for the ironic blessing, adesso la benedizione di Aaron. 
Ivarecheha Adonai Veishmarecha. Yair Adonai Panavalecha Vihuneka. Yisa Adonai Panavalecha Vihesim Lecha Shalom. Veshem Yeshua Hamashiach. Sar Shalom Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shalom. Che il Signore vi benedica e vi protegga. Il Signore faccia risplendere il suo volto su di voi e vi sia propizio. Che il Signore elevi il suo volto su di voi e vi dia la pace. In nome di Yeshua, Gesù, il Messia, il Principe della Pace. Shalom. bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Shabbat shalom.